Your potential expands as you move towards it. None of us can ever know what our potential is because as you move towards your potential, it expands and it expands again and again. And it's a great thing to understand, oh, I don't even know what my potential is, but I know one thing as I move towards it, it's moving. And what I find and what I find so fascinating, which I'm sure you do as well, is that human beings think too much. And when they go into the spiritual aspect, they make it more than what it is. today I have an exciting guest who I'm very proud to call my friend. So this is Shaman Durek who is a sixth generation shaman. He's an author of the best-selling book Spirit Hacking. I've read this. I love it. And it's all about keys to reclaim your personal power, transform yourself, light up the world. It has many ancient wisdoms in it that we can all learn from. And Shaman Derek is redefining what wellness means by putting the power back into the hands of the people. And I believe that you must never give agency for your health or indeed your wealth to someone else. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to see you. I miss you. Yeah, I've missed you too. We had such fun the last time we hang out and then everything got in the way, but you're here now. So I've got lots of questions to ask you. The first one is how do you teach people how to operate in the field of observing consciousness, when many of them don't actually even know what that means. Well, most people are operating in the idea of reaction. So they're looking at life, they're reacting to it, or they're actually creating relationships with different types of frequencies and energies that are taking place in their environment that they're most comfortable with and looking for those so they can actually connect with it. So what happens is most of us in life are going through and experiencing these different frequencies based on the things we've already been holding on to within ourselves, be it our upbringing, what we learned, what we heard, what we've seen, what we experienced through our AV. VK, our audio, visual, and kinesthetic, our approach to life. So the way to bring observation to people is to get them to learn to stop and go into observation instead of analyzing things. Because when they analyze, what they don't understand is they're taking information from the past and utilizing that information for something that is different and unknown. And you can't do that because the information you have does not support the information that is now being presented. So how do we develop ourselves as superhuman when the world is kind of in crisis, everything is disrupted, and we're, we're living in worry and uncertainty and often chaos? How can we operate as a superhuman when people say, oh, well, you know, I, it's the, you know, if you stop people and say, what's wrong? They go, it's, it's my boss, it's the weather, it's COVID, it's the traffic. We all think external things affect us. So how can you help people realize that it's internal things that affect us? So the first key to helping someone understand how to live a superhuman life is to begin to bring people back to themselves, right? You see, the, the idea of, I call it the nucleus effect. The nucleus effect is that most human beings spend more of their time outside of the center of their own nucleus and in someone else's nucleus figuring out that they can do something to help that person or to create change in that person. But what they don't realize is that the more they're away from the center of their nucleus, the more damage, the more harm, the more chaos is instilling because they're not there to hold that space for themselves and to manage that space with love and clarity and, and, and vision and all of these other things. And so what happens in society is that people are always looking at what's coming at the cell, what's coming at the nucleus. They don't realize that they're the ones who are bringing it in because they are the nucleus of that cell. So if they start doing the internal observation and creating awareness and change from within, the outer projection of the hologram that is actually being presented on the outside changes the people, the places, the events, the situations and experiences to be something completely different. So can you explain spirit hacking and how people are using it to feel good about themselves, to increase their level of happiness? 
Absolutely. What is what is spirit hacking to the people out there who don't really know what it is? What is it? So as we understand biohacking, biohacking is utilizing different types of supplements and different types of exercises and different types of ways in which to, to trick the body into activating certain things such as your mitochondria or creating cell growth or all of these different things that you want to do to be able to um, optimize your system. So spirit hacking is similar, but the difference is we're not not using supplements. We're not using uh, mechanical devices. We're not uh, freezing the body and heating up the body and doing all these different things. What you're actually doing is you're learning how to communicate with your body. You're learning how to have a relationship with your body the way it was supposed to have a relationship with, where you're not just treating your body or treating your emotions or treating your mind or treating your spirit like it's just some unforeign thing that you don't understand what it is, but you are actually developing developing a beautiful, beautiful awareness of its communication and your communication. And then you're able to hack into your physical, your emotional, your mental, your spiritual, because you're able to access those levels of communication. Most people don't know that you can actually talk to your liver. You yeah. can talk to your body. You can talk to your skin. You can talk to your emotions. You can talk to your mind and you can talk to your spirit. But we have not been taught that relationship is the number one key to us being able to develop our species and evolve ourselves. Yeah, because every cell has a micro brain and our cells do indeed respond to our thoughts and our words. So how do you demystify spirituality? How do you do that? So for me, demystifying spirituality is taking the nonsense out of it, Marissa. It's, it's, it's people have all of these very... Um, very broad, very um, very visual, very uh, expansive ways of looking at spirit. And what I find and what I find so fascinating, which I'm sure you do as well, is that human beings think too much. And when they go into the spiritual aspect, they make it more than what it is. It's really simple. It's easy. It's, 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 like, it's like a child can understand it. But if it becomes so much where it goes off into all these different levels, that's just the mind creating more things to make it more grandiose than what it really is. It's a part of our natural functioning process of our evolution. And so demystifying it is taking it down to the most simplest form. It's like basically taking all this information, putting it into a juicer and getting the best of the best and leaving the pulp and all the stuff that you don't need where it belongs. Yes, because of course, for generations, as you talk about being a sixth generation shaman, we realized years ago that we were a body and a mind and a spirit, and you couldn't separate them. And many years ago, I'm sure your ancestors were treating people with illness, would look at the mind, look at the situation, look at the life, they would treat the whole person, the whole body. And then all of a sudden, we began to treat just the body. Oh, you have depression. Oh, you have anxiety. Oh, you have insomnia. And we've moved so far away from, you know, like Marvin Gaye said, what's going on? Yeah. You know, whenever, I work, whenever I work with a client, I hear that song, what's going on? I love on? Marvin Gaye. What's going on? And then I hear that other song where they sort of tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And if you ask people the right questions, you get the right answers. So here's a great question. I know you'll answer it exquisitely because that's what you do. What question should we be asking ourselves in order to, be happier, be better humans? What questions do you think we should ask ourselves every day? I think the question that we really need to ask ourselves is how long are you going to be angry with life before you decide to stop playing the game? Yeah, that's a great question. Another one? Uh <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, another question I think is important for people to ask themselves is, um, what is the thing inside of you that you feel you need to hold on to, to be right about, so you can get love or, or, or make people see you suffer? Or like, what is, why, what is, the, what is the, the part of you that needs to hold on and fight yourself? Yeah. And, and what's the fight for? Yeah. Because the most important words are not hold on. The most important words are let go. go. And, you know, it's like, what are you fighting for? It's not important to be right. It's very important to be kind. It's not important to be right, but it's important to do the right thing. And often that's let go because life's too short to 
need to be right. And of course, when you're right, someone else is wrong. And I've worked with many suicidal teens. They all say the same thing. My parents make me wrong. Mm -hmm. And they teach me. And when you're, make, when you're being right, you're making someone else wrong. And that might ruin their world. Because if you're right, someone else is wrong. And how does that feel, making someone else wrong? doesn't feel great no and it's also about understanding that you cannot if you create these two juxtapositions or these dualities you're not able to create an understanding of communication and synthesis and synthesis is what we require more of on the planet because we are not able to truly develop ourselves so it's the the words that we're actually feeding our soul is actually what's giving our soul the power to become so if we constantly give give ourselves the incorrect data. Like a woman once said to me, you know, Shaman Dirk, I don't understand why I keep attracting these relationships. I'm like, what words are you feeding mm. your soul? Yeah. Like what words do you tell yourself? What, what, what's the data that you're giving yourself? Because whatever data streams you're accepting, that is actually writing your story. We say in shamanism, everything is a story. In ancient times, storytelling was the way in which you built your tribe. It's the way you built yeah. people. So what kind of story are you telling yourself? And that comes from the data you're taking yeah. in. Yeah. And sometimes it's not even your story. So the story is, I should have been a girl. I should have been a boy. I should have been academic. I should have been musical. But that's your parents' story. You know, my story was always I was the wrong baby. But then I realized that was my mother's story. It wasn't my story. And you have to choose. You can choose your story. You know, my book says that whole thing. Edit your story rewrite your life because your story is somewhat my dad wanted me to run his account my dad wanted to be a lawyer my mom wanted to be a doctor but, but that's her story it's not your story and as humans we have such a gift we can rewrite our story at any time and have a brand new story and we can change the beginning of the story then we get to change the middle then we get to change the whole ending and I find people do this very weird thing they keep trying to change the ending. My dad was a cold, distant dad. I know. I find a cold, distant partner, and I'll turn him into a warm, loving pussycat. But it's going to take years. Yeah. Don't change the ending. Change it. But find a warm, loving person at the beginning. I met somebody, one of my clients, who said, my mom said, darling, I'm very intelligent. I've never had children. I just find you so boring. I'm too intelligent, you see, to deal with you. And all his life, he remembered that. Who wouldn't? And he, guess what type of women he liked? Super smart women that made him feel stupid. And I said, oh no, you're, you're trying to change the ending. Find someone just like your mother and make her think you're the smartest person in the world. And really, you need to find someone who thinks you're smart. And by the way, if your mother was so smart, you think she might have known about birth control because she had two kids that bored her. And if she was that intelligent, maybe she would have stopped at one yeah. and just got a goldfish <laughs> or a dog instead. And when people understand, oh, I'm repeating the story and trying to change anyone, anyway, I have the opportunity of changing the beginning. So we can all do that. And I love the fact that you're showing people how to realize everything is about a story. But you're also a story. Somebody watching this, you are a story, but you have the honor and the privilege of changing your story. Thinking, I don't really like this script. I think I'll throw it away and start a new one. My script is I don't matter. No one loves me. But you can say I have a new script. I'm lovable. And I've got something to offer the world. And of course people love me because I'm lovable. Yes. I think there's a point in, in humanity and consciousness where in order for us to realize that most human beings walk around living out their projections and they're not really we call it in shamanism the phantom projection it's it's all the impulses and energies that you've taken on since you were a child and you've projected an image of yourself in the world that you think yeah. will be accepted but it's when you get past that and i think the question that people have to look at is the self-betrayal they create for themselves and instead of holding the i have to get love for the betrayal that I've already created for myself, they can actually start acknowledging and accepting and loving themselves gently with sweet with sweetness and kindness. Um, 
to be able to move through that self-betrayal to come into a place of integrity with themselves so that they're generating that with every single person that they come in contact with. So tell me about the giant age. What does it mean to be in the giant age and how do we know when we've got there? So the giant age is the age where the visionaries don't give up. The, the artists don't stop. The, the, the dreamers keep dreaming. It's, it's the age where you actually start off really big in your thinking. Because what we have to understand is that we live in a matrix. We live in a system that, that whenever you want to manifest something or create something, most people operate from a very small idea. And that's not living giant. Living giant means you go big, you go large in your thoughts, in your mind, in your dreams, in your visions. So spirit has something to, 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 to work with. Spirit needs something to work with and it can't work with some fizzle, dizzle, a little energy. It needs something big. It needs something grand. And so what happens is when you're living a giant age, you're living in a space where you're not worried if you make someone uncomfortable. Making people uncomfortable is a part of the evolutionary process. Sometimes when people get uncomfortable with you, it's because they're growing, they're changing, they're getting their triggers are being met because you are actually living your truth. It doesn't mean you go out and deliberately hurt people. It means that you live as big and as grand and as amazing and as powerful and as open and as free and as liberating as you want to without the fear of retribution or um, um, being ostracized or being made fun of or any of these things. And so that is what the giant age is. It's taking it to the level of grandness within your being so you live like a giant. I love that. Live like a giant. What's the first steps we need to do? So the first steps to living like a giant is to practice the art of not caring okay. about what people think and what people say. Understanding that people are having their own experience and you are a part of that experience yeah. to help them get there. So the key element is to think of, you know, I do this thing with my students, which is I'll make them make 12 boxes and each box is a dream. So they start off with one dream. Let's say I want to be a dancer. Okay. Now start off as big as you can. Now what's the next one? It has to be bigger than that one. And then what's the next one? It has to be bigger than that one and see if you can get to the 12th box of that dream. And if you can, then you, that's the power of manifestation and energy to live a giant life. So when you realize that you can actually, and then sometimes I have them do 24 boxes or I'll have them do 30 boxes and see how big you start looking at your life, your vision, the way you think about yourself, the way you think about life, the more you do that, the more you stretch yourself to be that giant, then your being gets comfortable with it and it goes, okay, this is who I am. That's so true because your potential expands as you move towards it. None of us can ever know what a potential is because as you move towards your potential it expands then it expands again and again and it's a great thing to understand oh I don't even know what my potential is but I know one thing as I move towards it it's moving and it's moving once your mind moves to a new dimension it never goes back again so tell me about life growing up as a sixth generation shaman Life growing up was difficult, I would say, because, you know, when you're a family, a, a black family. You're in which fa country, by the way? Where did so you grow up? So I grew up? up in Hawaii and in outside of San Francisco was this town okay. called Foster City. And, but my family's heritage comes from Haiti and from Ghana, mm -hmm. from West Africa. And then on my mom's side, we have um, the West Indian and the Norwegian. So growing up in a family in, a, in the States who's still practicing and acknowledging the shaman in, uh, the shamanic lineage in my family was challenging because you're, you're wanting, your father wants you to adapt to what's going on in the world. 
Mm -hmm. but he's not doing that in the home. He's still checking your clothes to see if you have spells on you. Did someone put some mojo on you? Let me, let me write all my name into all your clothes. And every time you walk in the door, he's putting your hand in his hand in your pocket and checking your stuff. Um, you have your, your spirits are con connecting with your ancestors. You're acknowledging all of these things and being a five-year-old kid, and having these um, spirits coming to you and realizing that you are the next one in the family who's inheriting the next level of shamanism from your lineage, you you don't live a normal child life, uh, a child life, yeah. you know, you it doesn't sound very normal. It's not normal. You know, so for, for you having friends, uh, you know, you don't get invited to the birthday parties because people think you're you're evil because a lot of people wow. will, will use religion and say that because you're you have these gifts and so forth, it must be a gift from the devil. Um, you spend a lot of time alone. Uh, your training and shamanism and the things that your family is sharing with you are very intense for a child's mind, you know, because you're not just sitting there thinking, oh, I want to go play with toys. You're thinking, oh, uh, there's some spirits that are coming at night to torment me and I have to use my powers and pass these tests to prove that I have these abilities to, 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 to maneuver myself to being who I am today. So, you know, you, you're practicing everything from from going into the underworld, talk, communicating to your ancestors, letting spirits come through your body, you know, dancing until you go into a trance and then you start prophesizing for the family, um, being able to access different levels of memories that have existed in different ancestors and share it with the family and see if they, uh, and they can qualify that it's true. Uh, experiencing, um, you know, intense, uh, pain and suffering, feeling emotional pain, learning how to use your empathic abilities to feel pain and then learn how to be able to not allow it to enter your body. There's all these different things you learn to be a shaman. And when you're a kid and it starts at such a young age and then you're going to school and you're at school and you're come home and you're mixing herbs and you're at, and you're at school again and you're learning things that are completely irrelevant to who you are mm. but you're still watching humanity and you know why people are doing what they're doing you know why your teacher is lying to you you know why your teacher is is getting upset because the spirits are telling you she had a fight with her husband the night before over some real estate stuff you you know and then you start speaking it out loud and people start getting freaked out because they see your accuracy mm. they start thinking okay something's must be wrong with you um you know let's go this person has uh, needs to go get checked and, you know, and then your father is kind of playing along with it, but then it comes home and tells you, don't share it with the world. Mm. So how do you do that? Well, yeah, because of course, for every child, when you're born, you have a real driver to find connection and avoid rejection. Every baby on the planet, every living thing on the planet is born hardwired to find connection and avoid rejection. Of course, we find connection by being the same. So that must have been extremely challenging for you because you weren't the same. You were different. Your home life was different. Everything was different. But it's kind of fascinating that you're now with a princess who actually had a very similar upbringing to you in the way that she had to also go through the cultural expectations. And she wasn't like everyone else. She was a princess operating outside of society but having to conform to its norms too. So... It's interesting because people probably think you and the princess come from very different worlds, but I actually am seeing how similar the worlds you come from are. So I'd love you to talk about that. Yes. So what's really interesting is when I was about 14 years old, my mother told me that I was going to be um, a part of the royal family and married to the princess of Norway. And, and that when the, you were 14? When I was 14. Wow. I was actually going skateboarding with my friends and... She said, you know, the elders in Valhall told me, um, the Viking elders told me about your future. And so I already know what's going to happen to you. So live your life and do what you want. But you're going to be, um, you know, and all the things that you're because my dad, my family was very strict in etiquette, like 
I come from a family that's of the arts. My aunt was a world famous opera singer. My cousin is a famous jazz musician. We 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 circled in the art world through the uh, different echelons of class and 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 leisure. So we were always raised to have suits. My dad, I mean, I never, I mean, I remember giving my dad his first pair of jeans. So coming into you know having that prediction that my mom gave me come true and being with her going into her family entering into the royal family being with the king and queen sitting at the royal tables being at the royal galas going to the royal weddings doing all of these things my etiquette was already trained in me and what what i've learned um from that experience is experiencing that we are so much alike, but also so different as yeah. well, you know? And when we first met each other, because we were set up on a blind date, when we first met each other, the first thing she said when she walked in the door, the moment the door opened, she said, I remember you. And I saw a flash of myself in Egypt holding these scepters, and she had her hand on my shoulder, and she's like, I found you. And literally, I saw us. And then when we were in England, we were walking by the Thames. And she goes, do you remember uh, this, this energy? And I said, yes. And she goes, where do you remember it from? And I said, Egypt. She goes, yes. Do you remember when we used to go down the Nile and you used to get so mad because they would put so much herbs on the fire and this whole boat would be smoking and everything? And I was like, oh, yes. And all the memories started coming back. And going into her family was very interesting because at first they didn't accept me. And even though they, because they're royal, they they have this way about them. I call it the royal graces. It's my joke that I make mm -hmm. with her. It's when they, when royals put on a, a, a certain appearance mm -hmm. of not to let you know what they really feel, but you know what it is, but they're doing it because they're so, you know, they're raised to always be, right. you know, yeah. a certain way. And I could tell that her family wasn't like, who is this girl, you know, with one, this black guy, two, he's bisexual, three, and he's a shaman. What is this about, right? And then finally, uh, uh, them learning about me and adjusting over the years to who I am and realizing that I am actually someone that they actually really enjoy having around because I bring different conversations to the table. I, I test boundaries, you know, I, I push the envelope, I would say, in her family that makes everyone think outside of ways they've never thought before. So I'll, I'll ask them questions about their mind, about dreams, about hypnotherapy, about meditation, about shamanism. I'll get into their thinking process and to be able to see how all these years and years of indoctrination of the way they were supposed to be in the royal family, the way they're supposed to think, the way they're supposed to look and view the world. And when I bring these things to them, how I can see the sparks. And when I see those sparks and I see them look at me and, and they smile or her dad or her mom and the family and the way that me and her are, our love is so connected because we don't argue with each other. We spend more time laughing. We honor each other's triggers. We don't tell each other, try, we don't try to play power games with each other. Mm -hmm. I hold space for her. She holds space for me. I love being um, a father to her children. Um, I love shifting over my um, Western horseback riding to more classical horseback riding. And I've been, uh, that's been such a wonderful joy in learning how to jump horses and, and to be riding with the family and just being with them has shifted so much of who I am, but also there are times where I'm with them where I feel like I'm suffocating and I don't have a voice and I feel like I'm, you know, I'm tight because there are a lot of strict rules. Tell me about that because you're describing darkness and light and you talk about that a lot in your book, that the darkness and the light and how do you find, how do you cope with that when you're in a very dark time even the fact that in Norway it's pitch black at three o'clock in the afternoon which must be <laughs> so alien someone who comes from a hot country but tell me about the darkness and how it exists within the light so I always look at the darkness as an amplifier of energy but whatever you put into it it amplifies and so what people have been putting into darkness since 
the ancient times is fear and oh i'm scared of monsters and then the monster becomes real like so darkness to me is an amplifier it's a magnetic amplifier of energy and the light is this it's it's this um expander and so when the darkness is there the darkness is there to help you to get to that expansion but to do so it has to amplify everything that's getting in the way of you getting there so when i'm in any situation like when I first came into her family it wasn't so much just the family that was the challenge for me it was the paparazzis I mean still to this day I mean I was at the mall you know recently and like I got cars following me around all the time people popping out of bushes taking pictures of me writing stories about me um just I think it was like you know um a couple weeks ago I had this, another situation and that in the beginning was challenging for me because I'm a person I'm a Scorpio I, I have a private side to me, you know, and when you have to close every window and every time you're out, there's someone in your face and there's always some kind of camera there or there's someone interviewing you or taking some picture of you, you start to build up these anxieties. So in the beginning, I had a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress and um, that was challenging. But what it did was it helped me to look at what was valuable to me. Yeah. You know, like what was like, what friends do I feel more comfortable around? And I know I can trust 100%. Which type of places do I really feel like is connecting? Like, where am I connecting with myself authentically? And that helped me. And she's been living it her whole life. So she was just, you know, there to support me. But at the same time, she was, you know, that gave me such an insight because people were having such an issue with the color of my skin, being with uh, the princess. And instead of me looking as a woe is me, I'm the so I'm such a victim. I used it as a way to turn around things and educate people instead of getting hurt and broken down and feeling like everyone's against me. Everyone's upset with me. Everyone's mean to me. I decided to use that energy and start educating people what racism is how it looks, why people are making these statements, what it's about. And it strengthened me to become an even stronger leader and teacher for showing people how to love doing a, uh, during great adversity. Yeah. And of course, the darkest hour is always the one just before the dawn. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why I love to spend most yeah. a lot of my time is in the darkness. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess in the darkness, because that's when you use your imagination. It's when you really tune in to who you are. So you've had to do a lot of work on self-mastery. What are your three top tips for mastering your own mind? What advice would you give our audience on how can they master their mind? And what did you do to master yours? You know, so one of the things that I did to master my mind was to um, stop fighting it mm -hmm. and stop judging it, stop looking for something wrong with it. I started talking and communicating with it. Like if I get a, a voice that speaks in my head that's coming from a very negative place, I would say, you know, that's not true. And um, I understand that, you know, you're sharing this with me and I love you, but this is the truth. And I would start learning how to utilize my mind as an efficient tool that could create new energy by the way in which I chose to react to it. So it's like when people dream and they have that monster chasing after mm -hmm. them. So for me, it's turning around and how much love can I give to something that is creating some antagonist energy towards me? And so I, so the way, the first thing I would do with my mind is, is just be there and not even judge it, not put a definition on it. One of the techniques that I use is I just let something come up and I go, I heard blah, blah, blah. I don't try to analyze it. I'm not trying to hold on to it. I'm not trying to, oh, what does that mean? Let me look it up on the computer. Let me figure it out. Let me, you know, none of that. I, analyzation is the death killer of spiritual evolution. It literally kills your spiritual evolution because you're not allowing the journey. And what I learned once from this Lakota elder was that when you are in the state of 
going into analyzing and, and wanting to figure things out, you're not journeying with spirit. You're not let spirit take you. You're controlling the way it's happening. And that control is limiting a huge amount of information and, um, and experience that you can be having. So what I do with the mind is I just let it go. I, if I hear something and if it says, uh, you're an idiot, I'll say, I heard you're an idiot. Uh, I heard you're really beautiful. I heard this. I heard that. And what it does is it takes me deeper into a relationship with my mind when now when something comes up, I can engage it. I can remove it. I can shift it. I can change it. And I can create something completely different. And you're so right because people have this belief, you know, oh, my mind is my enemy. My, I've got such a strong mind, such a weak mind, such an annoying so mind. So glad you said that. And in fact, your mind is your greatest friend. Your mind is a loyal ally. Your mind is really like the most efficient assistant you've ever had. And it's always doing what yes. it thinks you want to do. And people say, I, I, I can't find love. I can promise you your mind thinks you don't want that because... Once in a time you said something like, it would kill me if I got dumped. If another person ghosted me, it would be worse than death. And now you've told your mind, I don't want love. If I got fired again, it would be the end of me. I could never put myself back in that situation. This commute is driving me insane. So we don't understand that the mind is the genie and your wish is its command. And when you say things like, I'd die if I had to give another meeting like that, I, I, it would be the end of the world if I lost another baby, I couldn't go through that again. Your mind's going, oh, you don't want to go through that again? You just leave that with me and I'll make sure you never go through that again. <laughs> and we've all done this thing about, oh, what I would give for a week in bed. And then we wake up with a terrible cold or food poisoning. We spend a week in bed and the mind goes, but you asked for that. And so if you haven't got what you want in life, it's because you're not dialoguing effectively with your mind. Absolutely. And if you sit down and say, hey, mind, like when I want to go to sleep, I say to my mind, hey, mind, send sleep to me. I never go, I'm going to sleep because that's confusing. I get into bed, I've got to go somewhere now, but I just got into bed, switched off the lights, put the covers around me, now I've got to go somewhere. i got to fall. I, one of humans' greatest fears is falling, especially falling backwards. So falling asleep and going to sleep really confuse the mind. But when you say, Hey, mind, send sleep to me now and send it to me for eight hours, deep, wonderful sleep. Hey, mind, burn off these cookies I just ate. Hey, mind, I'm going for a meeting. I want to be super confident and say the right things. When you tell your mind what you want, it's like a biofeedback. What you present to your mind, it presents right back. I'm scared of doing that. Let me fill you up with fear and then you won't go. If you say, I'm so scared of this meeting today, I'm terrified, you increase the terror until you can't turn up at the meeting, job done, you didn't go. So what you present to your mind, it will turn around and present right back to you. And you present your mind with better things, like not what have I forgotten, what have I remembered? I'm terrible at this, what am I good at? I'm gonna be late, actually five minutes doesn't matter, everybody will understand, so we, we really do have a choice of presenting better stuff to our mind, like that garbage in, garbage out. Yes. If you present better stuff, you get better stuff back. Yes. So I'd love to ask you a question because my new book is called you know, Tell Yourself a Better Line. It's based on the premise, and I know you've seen it your entire life, that most of people's suffering comes from the lies they tell themselves. Yes. So I want to know, when you were a little kid, what were you telling yourself that you now see was a lie, but you didn't know that at the time? So when I was a kid, I believed everything was love. Um, and, then into, and then my stepmom would tell me that the world was going to be mad at me or beat me up or be mean to me because of the color of my skin. Wow, what a hard um, thing to hear. She would tell me that um, I, because I have uh, speech impediment stuff and I, my brain doesn't think the same way other kids are, I'm never going to be able to survive and make money and live a good life and people are always going to make fun of me and laugh at me and laugh at me every chance they get. Did you believe her? You were just a little kid. I did believe her. Until I when? I did believe her until I got into my teenage years. And then I realized that I was actually playing out 
the truth that she projected of onto course, me. Of course. And I begin to question a lot of things because at one point I was like the nerd in school who was like the weird kid who had powers, who would like w- bring his skate, wear, you know, ride my skateboard in, paint my nails, you know, wear rock and roll t-shirts like ACDC, Metallica, things like that. And people thought I was weird and no one like, they would just constantly bully me. And then I just realized one day that the bullying that I was experiencing at school was actually happening at home with mm. my stepmom and that she was my greatest teacher. She's here to say these things to me to see if I accept the program or not. I kept looking at her like some kind of like data, like dysfunctional data mm. machine that would be actually distributing data to me that was corrupt. And I kept, and because I played a lot of video games, I always saw myself as um, a person who had to dismantle that data or not accept the data, the corrupt data. So every time she would say something, I started laughing. Mm. Oh, good. Or I would say, oh, and is that what you think? Mm. Oh, well, that's a fascinating thought. And that's a great thing. Is that what you think? Because you're giving it back then. Oh, as in thank, when someone says something really mean, you go, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Oh, is that what you think? Thank you for sharing. That's interesting because you're not letting it in. And one of the most powerful things we can do is to not let in constructive criticism. But your stepmother, some people do that out of love. Oh, that's not going to work. Oh, no, don't get above your station. Don't don't expect that. It will never work out. Oh, don't aim for that. Aim lower. And many people who do that to us truly think they're helping us. That's not going to work. That's going to go wrong. No one in our family has done that. And they actually believe it's in our best interest. And other people do it because they're mean. And we know that People who are happy praise and people who are unhappy criticize. And critical people always, always have the most criticism reserved for themselves. But your stepmother, was she doing this because she didn't want you to get disappointed or did she have a different agenda? Her agenda, which I knew her agenda once I figured out Mm -hmm. what was going on in my teenage years, her agenda was to make me strong. Mm-hmm. So she believed that by doing these oh, things, oh, by yeah, diminishing you, you'd by get stronger. By diminishing me, I would get stronger because that's what mm-hmm. happened to her of in course. her childhood, growing up in Hawaii, and um, and for me, because I was a very sensitive kid, and I still am sensitive, but my sensitivity is now governed towards the idea of love. So if someone says something to me now that is not governed in love or empowerment or focusing on some energy that is actually making me feel good. I see it as a sickness, Mm -hmm. as an illness of the mouth. Yeah, illness of the mouth. I like that. (laughs) And I see it as a some kind of illness, a flu they must be going through. Oh, you must be having a flu. I say flu of the mouth. Yeah, you know, you have a flu of the mouth right now because these words fly out of your mouth. Yeah, Yeah, because these things are coming out. They're not coming out harmonically. They're not coming out to build, to lift, to shift, to take me higher. They're coming out. Um, because you're ill and there's yeah. illness. And so that's how I look at it now. And most parents, even the ones that do it, nobody wakes up and goes, where's Google? There must be a way I can ruin this child's life. Google, let me tap in. How can I ruin this child's life? Even parents who do a terrible job often think that they're doing a good job. And if they could do better, they would do better. My mother, I saw her as a grandmother and she was so much better because she wasn't living with my dad, who she clearly couldn't stand. So... She didn't understand my dad. It made her very unhappy. She wasn't very benevolent. As a grandmother, she was totally happy and she was loving and kind. I used to watch her thinking, wow, I could have had a mum like that. But she was unhappy. So I had great compassion for her because she couldn't leave when I was unhappy in my relationship. I could just go. I was an independent woman. So it's often very important to understand that most people don't come at you with a dis- with a motivation to ruin your life. They come at you with their own stuff and they truly think if I keep putting you down, if I keep criticizing you, you'll improve. We know now that the only thing that makes you improve is praise and more praise and someone believing in you. But You know, you've heard that thing, spare the rod and spoil spoil the the child. child. And of course, even stuff in the Bible, it's utterly wrong. Not that the Bible is wrong, but some of the things in it, you think, wow, 
That's, but, you know, we, we have to understand that every generation brings their own trauma in. It's very dark ages. Yeah. And I wanted to add to what you were saying, Marissa. The biggest reason we have that on our planet, and this is something that has to change in our future, is that we, ha we don't have dual adaptation. We have singular adaptation. That means that in dual adaptation, a child can tell the parent, you know, there's things I think you need to work on too in order to make changes. So that, because in tribal culture, in, 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 in ancient tribal culture, in shamanism, the whole entire tribe is, there's no hierarchy. Yeah, of course. Right? And so the adaptation of the tribe grows together because the child can tell the parent oh you know you really need to work on yourself yeah. because you have a lot of anger and it's sure. affecting me yeah right and then the parent would go and do that because the shaman of the tribe and whoever's um the elders of the tribe would make sure that everyone in the tribe is constantly uh, yeah. uh, growing mm. with the information that they're getting and not seeing it as a hurtful thing not seeing it as a place where we need to rebuttal it or defend it and so in our culture in modern day culture we don't have dual adaptation. We have singular adaptation, which is you speak to the kid, you indoctrinate the kid, and you use the same method of domestication that you would an animal by utilizing the idea of if you don't, you don't get love. Yeah. And you know and what you happens get, yeah. when that happens. So I've got two more questions before we run out of time. One is, how can we be our own guru? What could we do? Just some simple things to be our own guru. I think the first key to being your own guru is creating your own idea of what your kind of guru you are to yourself, creating your own routines, creating your own um, mythologies, uh, your own quotes, anything that represents you acknowledging your own wisdom and utilizing that wisdom for your own growth. Right. So so for me, living my life in the way that I do, I have rituals that I do every day, connecting to my ancestors, making offerings um, every day, doing all of these different things that I do, sitting in front of my altar, communicating to my spirit. That's me, but it may not be someone else. Someone else to be their own guru may be the first thing they do is they go out and they they sing a song yeah. or maybe they write a poem. Yeah. Or well, singing the song is was my next question, actually, because I believe we all sing a song. I'll die if you leave me. I can't live without you. You're the only one for me. But there's always a better song like, hey, I will survive. And when I, I was watching Cinderella with my daughter and the mice were singing, you can do it, you can do it, you can really, really do it. And I always remember that song. Whenever I was going for a meeting and I was going to sell my products, I'd, I'd hear that little song, the mice singing, you can do it, you can do it, you can really, really do it. And I learned that many of my clients have a song, I'm not good enough, no yeah, one's going to love much. me. And you have to sing a better song. So when I go on stage, I used to go on stage a lot to that song by Fat Boy Slim. I need to praise you like I do because I'm all about praise. And then I like that song by Shalimar, I Can Make You Feel Good. And then I like the song, This Girl Is On Fire. And now I love that song. By I love Adele. that song. What, this Girl Is On Fire, yeah, yes. this guy. And now my current one is Take It Easy On Me by Adele. And I was just a child. I didn't have the time to understand. And sometimes we can find a lyric. And when you have someone criticizing you or diminishing, you just sing your song. So if you had a, a song, a song title... And you had to pick that song, and it was going to be your song, which is another great song. Your song. What would your song be? And you can change them, but to different uh, periods. You know, I'm not familiar so much with the musical uh, things that are out there because that's not. I listen mostly to country music, and well, you can have a country music song. They have but, some good songs. But let's see. I mean, for me, I would say. Um, Mm -hmm. You remind me in in the um, in COVID, someone put a post up saying, "Jolene, you can come and take my man." And I thought yes. that was <laughs> I've been locked up with him for a year now. You can have him, and I, I love that. You know, I'm I'm very Zach Brown ban. I'm very like, um, you know, I'm happy with you know. It's like it, I forget the name of the song, but it's 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 all about you like being happy with your friends. What about the George Benson? The Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. That's a great song. Yeah, but I think learning to love myself is a little too cl cliche for me because everyone is always, whenever you go to like these psychic readers, are always like, oh, you need to learn to love yourself. I always think of love as an enhancement. Mm-hmm. 
So I would say my song is, and I got it now. Good. It's Xanadu by Olivia Newton John. Oh, I used to love that song. And it's You Have to Believe in Magic. Yeah. Well, Ro- Roald Dahl said only people who s- believe in magic ever get to see it and experience it. And that's a very good ending for our show today. Because you have if to you, believe in magic. If you believe in magic, you can see it and you can experience it and... Magic is whatever you choose to believe. You can make anything real because you are what you believe. So thank you for coming on. I love your song. And to think of you, every time I hear Xanadu, I haven't heard that song for years. (laughs) That's what came, that's what the spirits just said to me when you asked. I was going through all my country music and then all of a sudden I saw Olivia Newton-John and it's like, you have to believe in magic. Don't let your mind run astray. I, I love it. This would be a great song when I was a kid called You Can Do Magic. Do you remember that song, You Can Do Magic? Which one? Who sang that one? Limmy and oh, Family uh, yeah, Cooking. Yeah. Magic, magic. I like yeah. that one. La, la, yeah. Was it Love is Never Tragical when you feel the magical feelings coming through? I love songs because... We get to choose any time to pick better lyrics and to sing a better song. I love your song. Thanks for turning up. Thanks for sharing. Thank Thanks you. for sharing our audience that we can all pick a better song anytime and have yes. a better life. Thank you so much. Love it's been you. amazing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, my hun. Check out my next video here.